So I think we'll start. I know people will float in as we get going, but uh, Justice Marshall particularly wanted to be sure that there would be time for, for questions, and so we'll watch the time pretty carefully here. Welcome to Duke. What an honor to have you here. Well, thank you. It's just I wonderful mean, to be here. Uh, it goes without saying, Justice Marshall is one of the great uh, heroes, really, of 20th, 20th and 21st century uh, American justice system, and just one of the very outstanding people and had this amazing career. Uh, and it's I, because of, of who you are that we have both uh, my dean here, uh, Kerry Abrams, but and, and also uh, Digang Wozanaki is here from South Africa. You're South African, and I know that the two of you admire each other, admire one another a great deal. But uh, welcome to Duke as as, as well, uh, Justice Wozanaki, who will be receiving the Bulch Prize later uh, this semester. So, which is um, a great thing for all of us. And, so, uh, carrying on with our South African <laughs> start in life, um, you know, talk about that a little bit. You were a, a student activist. Uh, you know, that's uh, but that's a term that conjures up certain things in the United States, but probably different things for you in in South Africa during the time of apartheid. It would be interesting just to hear about that as a young person. Thank you, and I have to say it's wonderful to be here. This is one of the great national law schools, if not international law schools, and so the first thing I want to say to the students is, A, you've chosen a great profession, I mean, really great profession, and B, you have so many opportunities open to you, and so everybody who's not who's a student here today does not know where they are going to be, I promise you, in 35 years, at least if you listen to my story. So Justice Mosaneki, Justice Mosaneki was on the Constitutional Court in South Africa. The Constitutional Court only came into being after the end of apartheid. Um, and so, and he was one, listening to Justice Mosaneki is a little bit like listening to uh, John Marshall. I mean, they were really making new law, um, whereas if you sit on the Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts, it's the oldest court in the United States, and you've got a lot of precedents. They had no precedents, just a great new constitution. So it's a little embarrassing for me to talk about growing up in South Africa because I'm here with Justice Mosaneki. So take into account, every time I say South Africa, please read white South Africa. This will be helpful uh, because I am of a certain age. When I, and I grew up in a tiny, tiny village. Justice Mosaneki, where did you grow up? But, oh, he's a city kid. I mean, really <laughs> sophisticated. I grew up in this tiny, tiny village, Newcastle, halfway between Johannesburg and Durban. And it was a halfway place for salesmen, primarily. There was no hard top road. It was a dirt road going one way and a dirt road going the other way. And had you told me, even when I was you know, 12, 13, 14 years old, that I would end up in the United States, let alone be a lawyer, let alone be a judge, let alone be a chief justice. I mean, you know, the nuns who started me on my career would be absolutely shocked. <laughs> but so, pleased. <laughs> but so what really started me, you know, on this path, um, I was at university in the mid-1960s. I'm older than Justice Mosnecki. But... At that time, South Africa was probably at one of its most harsh periods because the two major uh, political parties, the Pan-African Congress and the African National Congress, had both been banned and outlawed and its leaders sent to prison. When did you go to prison, Justice Mosaneki? What year? 1960. Exactly. So all of the leaders had been put into prison or were banned Banned meant that you couldn't go outside uh, your house. You were sent to a remote area. Um, it, it was just Death Valley in South Africa. And there were, as there often are, a few university students who were just beginning to pop up our little heads because we were younger um, and 
somehow we had to do something. It was very unusual for white students to do that, and it was particularly unusual for a white girl, as we were called, to do that. Um, and I think what I learned in that process was, at that time, we had no idea that South, <coughs> South Africa would ever change at any particular time. The lesson that I learned from that is that history is made with everybody taking the tiniest little steps, just doing what you could do. And what do I mean by that? So one of the things uh, that I did was that, uh, Justice Mosaneki, I think you were on Robben Island, correct? It's very difficult to get to Robben Island. But there were political prisoners and other prisoners, African prisoners, black prisoners, who were in prisons which were located away from any city area. Um, and family visits were essentially one visit a year. Transportation for black people was very, very poor. And one of the things that a group of us organized was to meet the spouses often, or the family member, at the train station and take them to see <coughs> their family member who was in prison. Now, that sounds like the most simple, ridiculous, low-key. It's not going to change anything. But I think, for me, it meant that I had an opportunity to talk to people that I would not otherwise have had an opportunity to do and to learn about my own country, about which I knew nothing. And so one of the things I learned was if you get below the layer of where you are, happen to be situation, you learn a great deal. And as a consequence of just that simple act, I made friends, I made connections that I would not otherwise have made. And I came to understand South Africa in a different kind of way. If, because I was white, but more important because I was a woman, the privilege extended very broadly to me. It really did. Nevertheless, my activities were sufficiently under focus that there came a time when it really wasn't safe to me to remain there unless I was sufficiently courageous to go to prison, which I wasn't. <laughs> I mean, that's the difference between Justice Misineki and me, and judge it as you will. But I mean, it just wasn't. And so I was fortunate that I had a scholarship. My parents couldn't have afforded to send me out of the country, but I had a scholarship to come and study um, at Harvard, never thinking I would be a lawyer, never thinking that I would be a judge. I, I didn't know anything about law, except You, you the, came to be an art historian. I came to be an art historian. And uh, at some point, you discovered that you you had an interest in the law. How did that? How did that happen? Well, it took me a nanosecond to discover that um, I wasn't. In, I was interested, but I w wasn't a scholar, a sort of deep diving scholar, you know, studying European art. By the way, I'd majored in art history in the at my university, and do you think we'd learned anything about African history? Not one thing. It was as if the country in which I was living did not exist. So there was a wonderful phrase used by a great South African writer called, there was an ontological blindness. I mean, you can live and not see. So when people say to me, how couldn't you see? I mean, you can live and not see. And I think that's one thing I would caution you about. You can be lawyers and you can live and not see what is happening right in front of you. So that was one of the lessons. just wasn't appealing to me. And so um, I had to do something else. Um, I couldn't go back to South Africa. And a friend of mine said, why don't you go to law school? Law school? I said, what is law school? Why would I go to law school? And her answer was very clear. It's very easy. You do one year, two years, three years, and you're done. 
<laughs> Let me tell you, that is an enormous advantage because otherwise you do a PhD and it takes one year, two year, three year, four year, five year, six year, you're still not done because you're not going to get a job in philosophy. So you go to your seventh and your eighth year. Um, then I went to Yale because the admissions office at Harvard wasn't very polite to me. <laughs> and that's how you make lifelong decisions. <laughs> so I went to Yale, and I hate to say that the minute, the day one in law school, I just knew I was in the right place. I don't know what it was. It, it, it felt like coming home, even though it was not coming home at all. Um, I graduated, and I was living in Boston. I was commuting to Yale. Um, and I can honestly say I knew not one lawyer, let alone a judge in Massachusetts. I didn't know anybody. I mean, I just had, the only lawyers I knew were the Yale Law School, my colleagues and teachers. That was my exposure to the law. So I didn't have a clue as to what I was going to do. And then you went into practice. Well, I ended up in practice. You ended up um, Coming out of South Africa, my, my sense of what judges did was pretty bad because the whole apartheid system was enforced through the law. Footnote, that's the difference between a parliamentary system and a constitutional system. So Justice Mosineki was arrested because it was duly authorized and sentenced to a long prison sentence because it was duly authorized by the law and enforced by judges. So my view of the legal profession was not a very complimentary one. But the one thing I did know coming out of South Africa that was that criminal defendants were mostly guilty of nothing. And so what I wanted to do, of course, was be a criminal defense attorney. And so at the end of my first year at Yale, um, I went to work for one of the great civil liberties criminal defense attorneys, expecting that this would be my future. I was going to be the Perry Mason, well, the, you know, the Perina Mason of, some of you don't even know about Perry Mason, don't worry, look it up. Um, and of course, not predictably, but not unpredictably, I just felt very ill at ease. It was not the place that I wanted to be. I was sort of tried to put my finger on it, and I think it was because I felt so foreign in an American courtroom. I wasn't comfortable. I didn't, couldn't see myself persuading any jury. But perhaps worse is at the time, all the state court systems were run by Irish people, and they thought I was English. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was a, and even if I kept calling myself an immigrant, it didn't really help. Um, so I knew that that wasn't what I wanted to do. Then the question became was, what was I going to do? Well, of course, again, don't forget, I didn't know anybody. I didn't have any teachers or mentors. Or anything. So I did what people do. You go to the placement office, and a lot of law firms come to recruit. So I went to a law firm for that first summer, and it was, it was like being at law school. I just loved it. The first project that I had to work on was a usury project. I had never heard the word. I had to look it up. I mean, what do I know? I, I said to a group of students this morning, I took contracts in my first year at law school, and it took me half a semester to figure out that consideration meant something other than being kind to <laughs> I mean, you, you feel your way in pretty slowly if you don't know what you're doing. But I spent the summer working at the law firm, and I really loved it. Um, I found it challenging. I found it interesting. Um, and it set me off on an absolutely wonderful career. By the way, we didn't, our starting salary wasn't $190,000, which I think is the going rate in Boston this year. And I don't mind, you've all got debt to pay off. So that's absolutely fine. But I just love the sort of ideas, idea against idea. In addition to getting wonderful training, if you love the law, you will love working in a large law firm and you will love working in someplace else. But the other thing I found, um, David, was that that experience set me up for everything else that has happened. I think. You will find yourselves in such 
competitive places. But it doesn't matter whether you want to work as a criminal defense attorney, which would be wonderful, I have enormous regard for those, if you want to work in the US Attorney's Office, if you want to work for the ACLU, if you want to work for the right to the Second Amendment, it doesn't matter where you want to work. If you have the training and the qualifications of coming out of a large law firm, you will be in a much better place. I'm not making just a pitch for large law firms. I'm just saying don't rule out opportunities that come to you. You will all work for, well, I've been a lawyer and practicing and working for 45 years. You have a long career ahead of you. And I think the training and the experience and the hard work that you put in at the beginning will make such a difference. I mean, if you want to become a dean of a law school, if you want to be a federal judge, if you want to you know, run the American Law Institute, whatever it is that you want to do, you will never regret getting the very, very, very best training that you can right at the beginning. And it'll give you enormous, enormous opportunities. So you did that, and then you took a very, a very big job of being the general counsel, it was probably called vice president and general counsel for Harvard University. And those jobs, those are among the most difficult, challenging jobs I think that we have in the, in the legal world right now. There's so many issues. Well, they are the most difficult and challenging, but they are so much fun. I mean, you will not believe what the smartest people in the world do. <laughs> to get into trouble. Well, it's sort of like, <laughs> So I'm having the conversation, don't forget this is in the mid-90s, with a professor in Beijing, because I'm the only one who can have a privileged conversation, not that I think it made any difference. And it's like, Professor, yes, I know you are the world's walking expert in ancient Chinese weapon. Could you explain to me why you loaded the weapon before you went through security? <laughs> <laughs> and so on, and so forth. Um, so. It, you know, university like Duke or Harvard or any of these great universities are huge employers. They're landowners. They have immigration laws. They have workers' comp laws. They dispose of hazardous waste. They, I mean, it's every legal question. But you remember my comment about how much legal training I had before? Because I had been taught to look at the legal issues as a lawyer, you don't get sidetracked into thinking, well, just because it's a famous Nobel Prize winner, it, it doesn't make any difference. It doesn't make any difference. And I overlooked the sort of patents. And, you know, for example, Harvard at the time had many, many patents. But it had never sued when there was an infringement of the patent. And when I asked somebody, the answer was, well, Harvard never sues. <laughs> well, actually, Harvard is going to start suing. <laughs> <laughs> because why would you get a patent if you didn't? So the, it really was, um, it was just the most fun job. Now what has happened is that higher education law um, has become so sophisticated, and I'm not just talking about the employment and the real estate and the immigration. Uh, when I was at university, before I got to university, a few of the white universities admitted a few black students. But in 1959, the apartheid government passed legislation <clears throat> that said that white universities could no longer admit black students, that you were going to send black students to their own university. Black students didn't have very many universities. There was one great university um, in the Eastern Cape, but that was it, but they were going to start these new universities. And the two big white universities, mine and the University of Cape Town, set up, um, essentially, the universities made a statement that said, the purpose of a university and the independence of a university is to decide who to teach, what to teach, by whom they will be taught, and how they will teach. And that was what we considered academic freedom. And every year, there, I think, I don't know whether this still is Justice Mosaneki, but there was a, an annual um, day of affirmation to reaffirm those academic values. That is what I have always thought of as academic freedom. So 
who you teach. So there's a major case going on uh, in Massachusetts at the moment, accusing Harvard of not of having discriminated against Asian Americans, and the government is going to decide one way or the other if we see an appeal. I'm telling Harvard who you should admit. Who shall teach? Great nine to zero opinion written by great liberal justice, Justice Brennan, saying that when some a woman is up for tenure, the tenure files should be open. If any of you have been involved in any tenure processes, you will know that how tenure decisions get made is a very deliberative and mostly confidential thing. But the question was, she went to court to tell the government, to tell Princeton University, that she had been denied employment. Wonderful. I don't believe in sexual discrimination, and I believe in enforcement of Title VII, but it's worth thinking about when you ask the government to tell you who you teach and sh who shall teach. Oh, and what about what you teach? I wonder if we want people to tell us and to government which books that you can and can't teach and how you teach them, trigger warnings. I mean, there are all kinds of things where we have just kind of slipped into fundamental underminings of academic freedom. I mean, it's fine if you want the government to do that, but just think about it. So does the definition of academic freedom have any relevance in the United States? Well, actually, there's a wonderful opinion written by Justice Frank Furter in the McCarthy era, where an economics professor at the University of New Hampshire, Paul Sweezy, didn't want to take um, an oath to uphold the Constitution. I think I'm getting the facts correct. And Justice Frank Furter, and, and so he was going to get tossed out, and Justice Frank Furter wrote an opinion, and I can read it to you, quoting the South African statement of academic freedom, saying this is academic freedom. Be careful when you immediately think that it's okay for the government, and judges are the government, telling you who shall teach, what you shall teach, by whom you shall teach, and how you shall teach it. What is ethical? So it was a fun job. It sort of felt like bringing it full circle, and I thought that's where I was going to spend the rest of my life, happily hanging out with graduate students who were taking five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years to finish the <laughs> PhD. In art history. In art history. <laughs> And then lightning struck. Lightning did strike. Um, I had a call from the um, Governor Weld, his legal counsel, chief of staff, asked me to have lunch with him. Uh, there was a vacancy on the Supreme Judicial Court. He asked me whether I would be interested in being considered. Now, Governors and presidents will ask lots of people, are you interested? That is not a guarantee that you will make it onto the court. Quite the contrary. The, government will, the, will, the governor or the president will float up your name, now be telling presidential candidates you should tell us the names. Believe me, that's just to make sure that the governor, in my case, doesn't make a terrible mistake. Um, I haven't been really interested in becoming a judge. Um, and I had this wonderful job at Harvard. This really, really interesting, wonderful job that exposed me to terrific people and it took me all over the world with the most interesting legal questions. Well, why did I say yes to the Supreme Judicial Court? It goes back to my South African journey. I didn't know um, lawyers in South Africa, by and large. But there were two Supreme Court cases that I knew about. I have no idea how I knew about them. Somewhere along the line, somebody told me about them. The first will be obvious to you. It was Brown against Board of Education. South Africa was insisting that you had to have separate educational experiences for black students and for white students, and that those educational experiences would be equal. And we knew. And we know, and we always will, that they are not equal. And the language out of Board of Brown against Board of Education was very important. And so I knew about that case. 
There was another case decided by the Supreme Judicial Court. What did I know? I thought Supreme, Supreme, same court. Uh, that was decided in 1783 by the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court. That's the 1783 decision. The Massachusetts Constitution, which is the 1780 Constitution, starts with the words, all people are born free and equal and have certain natural and inalienable rights, among which can be counted life, liberty, and so on and so forth. The first case brought under the new Massachusetts Constitution. It was a case challenging slavery in Massachusetts. Massachusetts had slavery and was brought by a slave who said, excuse me here, justices, it says all, it was men in those days, all men are born free and equal. And I'm, this is sort of procedurally how the case came to be relevant. It was a challenge to slavery. Now, what was interesting about the case is that this was the first constitutional democracy. Okay. And it wasn't clear that a charter of rights would be enforced in the first instance. And if it was to be enforced, it wasn't at all clear that it would be enforced by judges. I mean, judges, there was no constitution before that, and you have a legislature and a governor, and you know how to do that kind of stuff. I mean, that's what England had. So why were these judges, in our language, would say even taking jurisdiction of the case, let alone deciding the case? But they did. Now, who was on the court? The court had five justices, all white men, all appointed by His Majesty the King. So the, I mean, in other words, the court was there, and after the Constitution, after the Revolution, they didn't create a new court. South African, we can get to that, did it differently, for different reasons. And these five justices, and we don't have any opinion, but we have the handwriting of the Chief Justice, which is now in the Massachusetts Historical Society, and I welcome you to go and look at it. It is breathtaking. It says, um, you have a different hue of skin, you have thick nose, you have a flat nose, thick lips, and curly hair. I mean, I'm literally practically quoting from Chief Justice Cushing's note, but you look like a man to me. And so with one quill pen, Massachusetts put an end to slavery. And there has been no slavery in Massachusetts since that time. I knew about that decision because I grew up in South Africa. And how important the court was to me is that I was the president of the Boston Bar Association, and when you leave an office, they will give you something. They will give you a bowl or a stand or something. And the then executive director of the Boston Bar Association sort of very nicely came to me and said, what would you like? Mm -hmm. Right? And I said, I would like a picture of the Supreme Judicial Court because that court had always been so, point, so important to me. So the notion that there was somebody who said, would you like to be on this court? I mean, it was just extraordinary for me. And so I said, yes. Um, of course, I never thought I'd be the Chief Justice, but that's a whole other. That's a, separate, <laughs> that, that's a different appointment, actually. That's a different appointment. But that also happened. And so you had, <laughs> so you had, you had some services of justice and some. Services. I had three years as a justice. That's pretty good. Oh. <laughs> and um, then, and then a long tenure. As and then I, then I was the chief justice. And again, I mean, for me, it was such a privilege. I mean, such an extraordinary privilege to serve on this court. Um, and. Look at my life, and when I say to you, you will not know what will happen to you. There will be opportunities. I'm quite sure that Justice Mosaneki would agree with me. The notion that when he went to prison in the mid 1960s, that he would end up on a new constitutional court is, well, maybe he had more foresight. Than <laughs> <laughs> did, but he had a vision. He had a vision. I want to talk just a little bit, and you can ask him later. But so when you have the end of apartheid. 
and you have a new constitution, what are you going to do with it? There's a Supreme Court. I mean, it's not called the Supreme Court, but the functional equivalent of all white. I think it was all white men in Johnson Plains, right? I mean, a, a Supreme Court. And you have a new constitution. Are you going to take those justices as Massachusetts did in 1780, or are you going to build a new constitutional court? And South Africa made the extraordinary decision to have a whole new court called the Constitutional Court. So you're going to be left with a Supreme Court and a Constitutional Court. And over time, I mean, you, you, you couldn't have a new South Africa with President Mandela as the new president and have a whole bunch of white men sitting up. I mean, you just couldn't. It was not, not feasible. Um, and so the two courts are sort of, they, they closer and closer. And the next two generations later, there will be one. But essentially, the, court, the constitutional court is a discretionary court that is the same as our United States Supreme Court is, that takes the opinions that it wants to take. Um, but it was, it, it was interesting for me to stand on this side and watch how you, how you deal with a new constitution, which has to be, and that's really, and I say Justice Mokunoshi is a John Marshall, I'm not kidding, it really is. So let's talk about your time, particularly as chief. And maybe do it in two buckets. One, as the, as the chief, the chief administrative officer of the, of the courts in Massachusetts. And that's, that's a big job right there. And then you're also, in some sense, the leader of the court uh, in its decision-making role, which is also a big job. You only have one vote, but you have, you have certain uh, powers of persuasion, and you, you, you are the senior member of the court, and you assign the opinion. Massachusetts also, I'd forgotten this until we talked about it last night, it also has provision for advisory opinions, which is kind of extraordinary and kind of wacky, but uh, <laughs> you, got a few, you got a few of those too. We could, we could talk about that. Why don't we start um, on the, well, I want to be sure we get to Goodridge. So why don't we start with Goodridge? Why, you know, so that, that's, that's a gigantic case. That's the, the first, I think, uh, court to um, find that uh, gay, gay marriage was um, a right under your state constitution. This mm -hmm. is not a federal case. There's, uh, it's a, and, and I don't know whether the argument was made state and federal. No, or no, 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 it no. It was just state. You malpractice in Massachusetts if you raise a, if you raise a federal question. Believe me, you just raise it under the state constitution. You don't go anywhere. Um, I mean, by and large. It's, yeah. So uh, why don't you t talk about that opinion a bit? It was a, a very a closely divided court. It's a seven-person court, and it was a 4-3 uh, decision. And it was by far and away the first of these opinions. Of very, it, did, did it, it was brave, I think, at, at the time. It was certain, certainly path-breaking. Uh, now, maybe with the benefit of hindsight, it just seems in, ineluctable. Um, and of course, we've had uh, a US Supreme Court decision um, that now is the one that probably gets read. But uh, nonetheless, at the time, it was, it was quite something. So I can describe it in different kinds of ways. But let me just try three or four different ways. Um, the first is, um, as I said to uh, P Professor uh, Marin Levy's ca case, on racial issues, and racial equality. I had a very tactile sense by, by 2003 where we were. I mean, I really did, because we'd had a number of cases. On gender, I certainly had a tactile sense. I mean, we had gone from discrimination against women who wanted to climb telephone poles to whether or not uh, universities could be ordered to admit women and all the other stuff in between. I mean, Massachusetts didn't provide for um, fertilization medical fertilization treatments for women. I mean, we, we covered the waterfront. I had a very tactile sense. Discrimination in, on disability grounds or even any other issues relating to dis I had a very tactile look, partly because I'd been at Harvard and there were medical students who claimed that they needed to take extra time or whatever the issues were. 
uh, we'd had cases where a deaf person wanted to be a fireman, blind people wanted to be whatever it was. So I, I really was in touch with those cases. When it came to um, sexual orientation cases, <coughs> employment and housing, sort of no problem. Those are classic, and, you know, but the Massachusetts Constitution had revised that opening provision, all people are created, and to say it will, and it will include, did not include sexual orientation. So gender, race, ethnic origin, and something else did not include sexual orientation. That, by the way, is important to address. Um, and I was totally unaware of same-sex couples wanting to be married. The Hawaii case had just skipped me by. Even the Vermont case, I mean, judges sitting on a court, you look at the issues that are being brought to you. You are actually not out there figuring out what else is going on in the landscape, civil, criminal, or anything else. You face what you face. That's enough to keep busy with that. So I was literally starting from a blank slate for myself. <clears throat> Plus, I had six colleagues, and I had no idea where they were. And the Supreme Judicial Court has a very strong tradition that justices do not talk about the cases among ourselves or with each other until after the <coughs> oral argument. So I had no idea where my colleagues were. I mean, on sort of criminal cases or civil cases, you know, I might have some idea, but I didn't have any idea where they were on those issues. Um, the other advantage that the advantage that we had is that Massachusetts did not have a DOMA, uh, Defense Against Marriage Act, so the legislature had not spoken. That made a big difference. Um, we had made lots of changes in the common law related to marriage. And we had Professor Bartlett's The Principles of Marriage of the American Law Institute, where she was the reporter, which had influenced me greatly as a justice as I had had to decide cases about same-sex couples who were not married, but who were living together and had children, or the one supported the other. I mean, that had been enormously helpful. So I was sort of accustomed not to whether same-sex couples wanted to get married, but what was happening in families uh, where uh, people of the same gender were living together. And the last point I suppose I want to make is that the Massachusetts, um, the, the Commonwealth, the government, had been placing children for adoption with same-sex couples, whether or not, well, they couldn't be married. Now, in Florida at the time, and I think I'm correct, Judge Walker, but correct me if I'm not, if you were a married heterosexual couple and you divorced and one of the spouses went to live with the same gender person, you automatically lost custody of your children. I think that was the case in Florida at the time. So there was a lot going on in Massachusetts that if you deciding a case of first impression, you, you sort of look to that. Then you say to your law clerk, Please don't tell me what the other states have done on this issue. <laughs> and your very smart Duke Law School educated law clerk comes back and says, well, nobody's decided. And then you say, please go and look again. And they come back. <laughs> and then you say, and I say this with particular respect to Justice Scalia, go and look and see what other courts have done. What did he, where did he think I was going to look? I wasn't going to look in Saudi Arabia or even Taiwan. I was going to look in Canada, England, Australia, South Africa, South Africa by then, because it has sexual orientation specifically in its constitution, and the South African constitutional court was getting quoted all over the world by then. Nobody's decided. What are you talking about? Nobody's decided. No, no, no. The Netherlands has done it by statute. Nobody else has decided this. Now, the one thing that you don't want to do as a judge, especially a state court judge, 
is set any kind of precedent. You really don't. You want to be able to say, see also Montana <laughs> or, you know, Alabama. I don't care. Anybody, or, you know, the Third Circuit or just about anybody. But when your law clerks come back, well, then what do you do? You go to the professors who've all signed amicus briefs, by the way, on both sides of the question. Um, I mean, you try, and then you just have to decide. Now, when you're a state court judge, you do not expect any decision to become national, let alone international news within a week. You just don't, David. I mean, maybe if you were a circuit judge, maybe, but actually the United States Supreme Court, that's where it happens, or the English Supreme Court or the Canadian Supreme Court. I'm not minimizing, but I'm one of 56 chief justices because you've got to include the Virgin Islands and Guam and Mariana Islands. And, and Justice Breyer has this wonderful phrase about state courts are the bubbling up process. You know, Massachusetts will do it, then New York says no, and little by little it will bubble up. You know, here, remember where I was born in Newcastle? And now I have the President of the United States saying, you are a bad judge. It's like, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's a little, so um, on the other hand, when I come to a wonderful law school like this and somebody says, I taught you a case, I always say, you mean my workers' compensation case? <laughs> I mean, there is only <laughs> one case. Actually, I had a wonderful visit in Kentucky for some reason, and a group of students came up and said, we, we, we studied your case today, and I said, you mean, which one? Oh, so they, Woodward, Woodward, they said. Now, Woodward was the first degree nanny murder case, but that wasn't the one that they discovered. They discovered one where, get this, total lovers. So there's a mummy and a daddy in their 20s. The daddy's told that he has cancer, and unless he has major treatment, he's going to die. But if he has the major treatment, probably will be infertile. So they decide to harvest the sperm. I don't think John Adams would have got this. Anyway, they decide to harvest the sperm, keep the sperm. He undergoes the chemo treatment, and then very sadly, it doesn't work, and he dies. And then the mummy decides that she would like, nevertheless, to have a child, and you can do that. She goes to the fertility clinic, she gets the sperm, she gets the egg, it comes together. And two beautiful little girls. What's the question that the judge has to decide? Are the two little girls offspring, descendants for purposes of social security benefits, inheriting from the estate? Think about it. I mean, since when do judges get to decide? Questions like that. It won't surprise you to know that this case was filed in the federal court. Now, what do you think the federal judge did with it? Not this one, but he could have. Why don't we certify it to the Supreme yeah. Judicial Court? I don't know how to. Know how to do. So we have to decide. It's actually a bit, it happened to be Social Security benefits. Well, it's one thing if you're the federal government and you say they can get Social Security benefits, but think about. You know, all those elderly men who marry women and they, I'm kidding, but you know, you can understand. And one thing we know from estate, trust in estates, we think you're not against trust in estate cases, is settle the estate. Anybody here teach or study trust in estates, whoever does, you've got to settle the estate quickly. You don't want it to drag on for generations. Well, if you're harvesting the sperm or, or freezing the eggs, these babies can be born. 50, 60, 70, 80 years later. And you don't want a Rockefeller or Carnegie being born 100 years later. Anyway. Uh, it's pretty interesting. Uh, we want to open it up. Uh, so we'll just hold the thought about you as an administrator. Oh, uh, yes. But we'll we'll just, skip uh, that. Maybe, <laughs> well, we won't skip it, but maybe we'll come back to it. But let's uh, give giving students... Uh, the privilege of being students. Let's Especially see. if they're sitting in the back row. Yeah. <laughs> any, any questions? Yes, sir. Uh, I was 10 when the Buttigieg decision came out, and I remember almost overnight it was the issue in town that all of the grown-ups were talking about. And so 
returning back to that, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about what it was like for you personally in those sort of weeks and months that became a whole, a whole hoopla around this, the legislature and the governor got involved. Can you talk a little bit more what that was like yeah. for you personally? Um, it was, and I mean this quite genuinely. First of all, none of my friends really talked to me about it because I think I had trained all of my friends never talk to me about cases, partly because you never know where it's going to go. Um, and it took me a while to realize, I mean, I did notice what, you know, what was in the press, but I didn't realize quite what the impact was going to be. I, I just didn't. The first time I realized how serious the impact was, is when I had very good friends saying, because you'll remember that was sort of part of the race. So the, the decision was 2000, November 2003. That got us to 2004. There was election in 2004, and that was President Bush against Senator Kerry, a Massachusetts senator. And I had friends in the Democratic Party saying to me, why didn't you hold up a white, even before the election, why didn't you hold up the decision until after the election? Now, the very fact that an American was asking me that question struck me as so um, ill-advised about this. You don't want judges looking over your shoulders to decide, is it going to have an impact on the election or not? You can't think that way. And there are people today who feel that the reason why President Bush was elected was because of my gay marriage decision. I don't think there's information that substantiates that, but the people who believe it, they believe it. And if they didn't like President Bush, they hold me accountable. And if they like President Bush, they never give me the credit. <laughs> <laughs> um, I began to understand the international implications. I happened to subscribe to The Economist, so, you know. I'm sitting in Massachusetts, and I open up The Economist, and it says, I, I can't remember the words, but something with a stroke of surety that, you know, the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court Chief Justice has just written an opinion. So that was stage number two. I thought, well, it's making it up to some level. The third time I began to realize that it was more than just a judicial opinion that I had written was <clears throat> a friend of mine who'd been to a wedding in Virginia. This is like 2004, 2005. So it's only Massachusetts. And said, I thought you'd like to see this wedding ceremony program. And it has, you know, the husband that husband and the wife, I don't know who they are, and they're going to play Bach coming in and something coming out, and then they're going to be readings. And the readings are Shakespeare, T.S. Eliot, and my Goodrich opinion. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I said, this is good, but it's kind of ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, it really is kind of ridiculous. Um, so little by little, and really little by little, the immediate reaction from people who wrote to the court was interesting to me. Um, the people opposed to gay marriage, almost all of it, and they, I'm talking about hundreds and hundreds of letters that came to the court, almost all the letters had a sameness to them. They weren't written by the same, and they weren't you know, mass produced. But they essentially fell into two categories. Either it's against God's wish, or you should have left it up to the legislature. The second in particular is not an irrelevant comment. The ones in favor of gay marriage, it was interesting, um, almost none of them came from gay people themselves. They tended to come from siblings, classmates, friends, uh, parents, saying, I've known David all my life. He always knew who he was. He's never suggested that he wasn't gay. I've never seen him so happy. Over, over, and over. Or 
I knew my daughter was gay, it's been fine with me, but I always, I always was fearful that she wouldn't be able to get a job or she would never be happy. I mean, very textured, very textured letters. So that's another way of looking at it. And the third way is I started getting hauled before the Judicial Conduct Commission by people who were so opposed to it and just about anything that I did, they would file a complaint against me and I had to take that seriously. Or counted that. So Goodrich is November 2003, it's now January 2020 and there has not been one week, not one week anywhere in the world where somebody hasn't come up to me and said, thank you, or, you know, whatever it is, or you're responsible for the Iraq war. <laughs> I mean, I get it. <laughs> I get it. But the positives, the positives are much more likely. So, you know, I think of all the other opinions. And let me say, David, if I can, just one last thing. I like to remind people that we had the argument for Goodridge on first. I mean, I'm not stupid. I could see the court being it's going to be joined. So the clerk put that up first. And at the end of the argument, which went over the, a lot of time, not surprisingly, almost everybody left the courtroom. But not everybody else. Not everybody. Because we had three or four other cases that day. And to those people, their case was infinitely more important than whatever had gone on before. They were waiting anxiously. And I had to close the briefs, close my notes, move the case to the side, and take the next case. And I had to give it as much attention and as much care. And that, for me, was always the most important thing. Every case is important. So while I understand when law professors say, I taught your case today, I really do mean something when I say, you mean my workers' comp case, because that's just as important. That's a long answer your question, but thank you. But it does make a, a, quite an interesting point, which is that this, the Supreme Judicial Court is not a so-called constitutional court. It has a full range of, of cases, workers' comp, lots of common law cases. And federal and state. Federal and state. And we decide federal statutes, federal constitutional questions, and for a long time, nobody uh, raised this. I mean, in the 40s, 50s, I would be very surprised if anybody raised the Massachusetts Constitution case. Very surprised. Um, There's one. Uh, you, you may be interested to know that uh, we, I had the posthumous offspring question as a, I presume it was an exam question here. It was a practice exam for me um, in a statutory interpretation class. Did you, did you get it right? <laughs> I just thought it was a practice one. A question. <laughs> um, but, but my question was, how, how did your experience growing up in South Africa in a, in a very different country inform your career as a lawyer and how you thought about legal questions as a, as a judge? As a so because I had no legal training and no expectation that I would be as a lawyer. I never sort of thought about law. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't have a clue what lawyers did in South Africa. I mean, I really wouldn't. I mean, some of it is common law, but there's also a huge over law of Roman Dutch law and statutory law and now, of course, constitutional law. So in a narrow sense, it didn't impact me at all. I think in a broader sense, now that I'm off the bench, um, I think it affected me in this way, and I can't even think of a specific case, gay marriage included. I mean, I wasn't thinking about South Africa. I grew up in a system where I was told that black people weren't smart, couldn't do something, couldn't govern. You know, it was just, that's what I was told. Um, and I knew that was wrong. How did I know that was wrong? Because I was taking people to prison and back in another context, having the most sophisticated conversations. I mean, I knew it was wrong. So I think when anybody says to me, people cannot do something, or that's not what they like, or, um, you know, a deaf person cannot be a fireman, 
I, I think there's something in me that says, take a look at that. Or a consumer can't do this, or uh, you know, a, a real estate developer shouldn't do that. I mean, it's not just in um, what we would call discrimination or equal protection. It's in everything. I tend to, we tend to be far too balanced. I mean, I'm always looking at the other side. And that part may be, may be judicial thing, but when I came to Harvard, my, my question about, well, why haven't we sued? was because, don't tell me that we can't sue, like Harvard doesn't sue. And, and Harvard really thought it didn't sue. I mean, my other wonderful example at Harvard, if I can do that, Harvard, for the 350th anniversary of Harvard, the corporation, which was the board of trustees, had a long discussion, think about this, as to whether it could demean the Harvard name by letting the Harvard name and seal appear on mugs. Think about this. So they did it for, yes for mugs, no for sweatshirts, no for caps, and, and no for baby clothes. <laughs> when I became the general counsel, partly because I had come from a different experience. Now, was that experience South Africa or was it I'd done trademark law. I looked at this and said, it's about time we registered this trademark. I mean, this mark. I mean, this is a valuable mark. And I, I wasn't getting very far. How many of you know the chain of stores called Marks and Spencers in England? Anyway, let me just say it started off as a clothing store, and then it got into women's toiletries you know, soaps and perfumes. And the women's toiletries were like primrose and violet and lily of the valley and gardenia. And then it got into men's toiletries, like, you know, and this kind of stuff. <clears throat> um, and guess what name they used? I can just tell you, it was in a crimson box with a green stripe, and it said Harvard. And when I presented that to the corporation, I said, it's time. Now, whether that was my experience in <laughs> South Africa or just think out of the box, <laughs> there's another way to look at this question. I don't know. <clears throat> but I certainly, I certainly had in mind some of the great South Africans. I mean, and I was very fortunate. I met great, great South Africans. Um, so. Well, we have reached the witching hour. Thank you for being our judge in residence and for your amazing contributions to American Thank you, David. Law. It's been just wonderful to be here, really wonderful. And I hope each of you just lives the kind of professional career that you would most love to do. And that can be just about anything, just about anything. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>